You may or may not know this, but a lot of my seminary training was in church planting uh, and starting new churches. And there's this rule in church planting that whenever you launch a service, no matter how many times you've prayed, no how many checklists you've checked off and gone over every detail to make sure everything is going to be smooth and seamless, that something's not going to work and you're going to think it's a tragedy. Well, we go to two services and somehow the screens do not work no matter what we try. And yet God is still at work, right? Um, thank God for phones and we can Google lyrics or whatever we need to do. Uh, I was sitting here as Pastor Thomas was doing our prayer and, and we were sitting there in the kind of prayers of thanksgiving and I was astounded is maybe the wrong word, but I don't know, pleasantly surprised just sitting there in that moment because I was thinking of how many things I'm grateful for. Um, the ways that God is moving, and, and some of it is like kids are back to school, and all the parents said, hallelujah, amen, right? Other things like, I don't know if you know this, but next Saturday at 11 a.m., turn on ESPN, and college football is back. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, Florida State is playing Georgia Tech in Dublin, Ireland. If you need any more details, find me after service. We can chat. Um, but there are silly things like that that we can say thank you, God, for. But really, it is, it is God at work in the midst of lives all around us. This morning's service and having to go to two services. The fact that a couple weeks ago, we just hired a kids director for Georgetown campus because we anticipate that we're going to have an, too many kids and we need someone to be in charge of them. Amen? Like, uh, God is working in all sorts of ways, and we're excited that Sydney uh, Ramey has joined our Georgetown campus staff to help us with kids' ministry. Uh, things like, holy crud, Chris Cutler and I are looking at the all the things to do before we launch that campus, and next Sunday is our soft launch in which we're anticipating about 40 people to join us, and that's before we ever go public with worship. God is at work, and I'm humbled to be a part of it. And one of the things that I just keep sitting with, and, and if I can just share my own personal prayer life right now, is God, I want to continue to be about what you're doing. God, I want the Holy Spirit to continue to, to drive the church, and, and whatever that looks like, God, I want to be a part of it. And I want to open myself up to that, and, and I want the church to be open to that. And so... Uh, Whatever that is, God, lead us. And part of that, I think, is continuing this culture of inviting and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we're in this sermon series called Witness, and we really want to wrestle with what does it look like to share our faith? We are good news church, so we should be about the business of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And if, if you take the church term evangelize, and you look at the original Greek, it is simply to bear good news. To tell people about what Jesus has done in here and hopes that they experience the same thing. And so during this series, we're really looking at how do we tell people, how do we tell our family and our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, how do we witness to what God has done in our own life? And really, we want to be intentional and give you some practical ways to do that. Last week I told you that, that I, uh, I'm setting the goal for all of us to have five people over the next school year, the next nine months, that we witness to. And what do I mean by witness? I mean that we're praying for, that we disciple, that we share the good news of Jesus Christ, that maybe we invite them to lunch or, or to church, but then maybe we've got to like say, hey, I'll buy your lunch if you come to church. I promise that preacher won't go too long past noon. Right? Like, whatever it looks like, how do we minister to five people in our lives over a nine-month period? And how do we commit to what Christ is calling us to, and it may be your coworker or whoever it might be. 
Because the thing is, is I keep coming back to this number in my own prayer life that, that God is calling this campus to worship about 225 by Christmas time. That's why we went to two services. We can't fit 225 people in here. And so what does it look like for us to share the good news with people? Why? Because a number is a number, but a number represents people. And for every person there, it's a story. It's a person that Christ died for, that Christ loved. So how can we share the good news with them? Because if we're going to be a church that makes a difference in Williamson County, if we're going to be a church that makes disciples, that, who make disciples, who make disciples, and really be a part of this disciple-making movement, we have got to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We've got to tell people what Jesus has done for you specifically. Tell them what he's done for you specifically. And maybe that's a question for you this morning. What is my story? What is my story? Like, what difference has Jesus made in my own life? Because until I know that difference, I can't tell people about how he's changed my life, right? you got to do the first step before you can do the second step. But once you understand how Jesus has changed you and maybe broken uh, your chains of addiction or taken you out of a place of shame or, or struggling with loneliness or, or struggling with self-worth or whatever it might be, once you understand where Jesus has taken you from that low spot to where you are now, then sharing the good news of Jesus isn't awkward. It's not weird because you're just remembering what he's done for you. And last week we talked about this idea that, that the gospel way of evangelizing, the, the scriptural, the biblical way of, of telling people about Jesus is simply to say, come and see. Come and see what Christ has done for me, and I would love for you to have that same experience so that you can go and tell others. Come and see. Come and see. Go and tell. It's pretty simple. And yet I think sometimes we get hung up on it because when we, hear, when we think about like, telling people about Jesus, how many of us feel icky because it feels like we're used car salesmen for Jesus, right? That we've got to close the deal or whatever. But come and see, says it's not about you. But you're inviting them to see what Jesus might do in their life. And you're expecting Jesus to show up for them just as he has for you. And during this whole sermon series, we're going to be looking at a scripture uh, coming from Acts chapter 16. So if you have your Bible or a Bible app, since it won't be on the screens this morning, I invite you to turn your Bible there. If not, just hear these words. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 25, says, Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he brought everyone in his household. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've been struck this week by verse 25, the very beginning of the story, where it says, Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. The other prisoners were listening. When I picture this scene, like the dungeon was not some, but they were stripped, they were beaten. They were chained to the wall. They probably couldn't really move. And yet in the midst of that, Paul and Silas are sitting there saying, I raise a hallelujah. Okay, probably not singing that, but they were singing a hymn, right? 
And they're praising God in the midst of what seemed like a really cruddy situation. They're singing God's praises. And then it says that the prisoners were listening. The prisoners were listening. I wonder how many of us actually realize that people watch how we live our lives, that people listen to the way we speak. Like, do we realize that people are watching us? And and some of the questions they ask us as followers of Jesus is, do we live a little different than the world around us? Do we treat people differently than those who don't go to church, who don't follow Jesus? Right? Like, they watch us and how we live, and and for some of us, that's experiencing peace in the midst of chaos. For others, it's like this joy that that can't be uh, put out. Like, we just have this fire. Or or for some of us, they're watching, do we actually, uh, like, live into the moral code we profess? For others of us, they're watching, like, do we act the same when life is all good and when when, when it feels like the bottom is just falling out on us? The prisoners were watching. Paul and Silas. And I think one of the questions they might have been thinking is like, who are these crazy yahoos in the middle of the night singing hymns to Jesus in the midst of this situation? And like, not just who are these crazy yahoos, but why are they different than me chained to the wall not praising God? I wonder how many prisoners around us to addictions or whatever, are looking at us, watching us, wondering, why are they so different than us? See, the thing is, is if we want to be a witness, if we want to share the good news of Jesus, we can't just proclaim it with our lips. We've got to live the example of Christ. And this is a theme throughout Scripture. That we've actually got to live up to what we say with our beliefs. And I wonder if that's why sometimes we don't truly witness, that we don't tell people about Jesus because we look at our lives and we're like, ooh, it is a hot mess over here. And they're going to judge me for, for not lining up with all of that. And so maybe for us, the first step is to deal with all of this over here and invite Christ into it. But the next step is then for us to actually live into the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And the New Testament especially was super keen on this. And and Thomas and I have been watching and and studying these disciple-making movements, these groups of people who are making disciples to go on to make disciples, to go on to make disciples. And we've been asking, how can good news be a part of something like that here in Williamson County? And you know what verse they continually come to? It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. When Paul says this, he says, you should imitate me as I imitate Christ. You should imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me because I'm following Jesus. I'm going to be the example of Christ in your life, and I'm going to have this expectation that my life is going to match, my words are going to match the life I'm living, and then I'm going to show you how to do that because I'm following Jesus, and I want you to do the same thing. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul wanted your actions, your life, to echo the way you talk about living for Jesus. Let me ask you, are you being an example of Christ in the way you live? Because someone's always watching. And is Christ really real in your life? There are several areas in which Jesus calls us to be an example in our lives. The first is this, to be an example and servanthood. An example in servanthood. Uh, every Sunday we close our service here at Good News at the communion table. Remembering that last night in which Christ would give himself up for us, right? But there's a part that we don't do every Sunday of the Last Supper. And that's the foot washing that Jesus did. Feet are just kind of gross, right? Like what if What if I told you you had to wash the foot, the feet of the person behind you in line as you came to communion? Some of y'all are like, that's all right, that's my spouse, it's okay. Others are like, ooh, that's my spouse, yuck, right? 
But John chapter 13 tells us that after the meal, after the Last Supper, Jesus washed his feet. John chapter 13 says, After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. And I, I, We don't really talk about this part of the story, but it's kind of this weird thing that Jesus is doing here, because the custom at the time was, you walked around in sandals or bare feet, and, and when you entered into the house, you washed your feet. In fact, the custom was for the kind of lowest person in a social stat, a stratosphere, whatever, right? The lowest person in that hierarchy had the job of washing the feet before everyone walked into the house. And it was an act of hospitality, yes. But personally, I think it is also the homeowner being like, ah, everyone's washing their feet before they come in. And so they had done that, and then they ate the meal, and then Jesus washes their feet a second time. Jesus chose the master after the meal, chose to do the lowly job. Why? Verse 15 says, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. What he's saying is, it's important for you to serve. Earlier, he would say the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served, right? And he's showing them with his actions. It's not just with his lips, but he's living this thing out because he knows when you serve, it changes the relationship with the person you serve. You like you, you, you begin to love them in a different way. It strengthens that relationship. It builds credibility and trust. Like the, there's something happens as you serve someone and you begin to see them in a different light. You begin to see the inherent value. You begin to see them the way that Jesus sees them. Jesus says, serve as I have served you. Can we be honest? It can be as cook, easy as cooking a meal for someone. Or just calling someone and checking in on them. Picking up coffee for a coworker on the way in. Serve as I've served you. I've been thinking about this. A friend of mine, Laura, who lost her husband, I guess a couple of years ago now, posted this week on our Facebook about this idea of people showing up and serving one another. And she said, in the midst of grief... A lot of us say, let me know what you need and I'll be there, right? Like, we don't want to impose, so we say, let me know how we can help. And She said that feels kind of like a cop-out. Because in your moment of need, in your moment of grief, sometimes it's hard to even articulate what you need. She said, you know what, sometimes it just, is just showing up and doing whatever you think is needed. Maybe it's, I don't know, watching the kids for a few minutes for a single mom who might need just a few moments of silence, right? Just show up and serve. Because serving is at the heart of Christ. The second thing is, is to be an example in suffering. To be an example in suffering. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, Of course you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow His steps. Can we be real real quick? Following Jesus isn't always easy. There might be times when we hurt, we suffer. In fact, just because you go to church every week or every once a month or whatever it looks like for you doesn't mean that life is going to be all good all the time. There are going to be diagnoses. There are going to be miscarriages. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be pain. It doesn't matter. All of that is true. And let's be real about it. But it, let's also not hide it. 
Let's acknowledge it. And we can even be mad about it. The Psalms, can I let you in on a secret? The Psalms are a lot of people, especially David, being like, God, why did you... Whatever. And yet in the midst of that, don't lose your faith. Turn to Christ in that moment. Scripture said, be patient in your suffering as you do good. Don't respond in a way that loses your credibility or, or compromises your faith in the midst of suffering. How you respond to suffering matters. The third thing is be an example in loving. What do we mean by loving? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And we say, got it, cool. Even here at Good News, we say uh, one of our church values is to, to share the good news of Jesus by being a good neighbor. But what does that look like? Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustices, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Some of y'all are like, yeah, that's a great wedding scripture. No, Paul's speaking about how we as followers of Christ are supposed to relate with one another, and with the world around us. Because really, that's who Jesus was. That's who Jesus is. And this is a call to be patient with your kids on Friday night after the first week of school when you just want to wring their neck because they're whiny as all get out, right? That's love. Or maybe you have a, not that it ever happens anywhere, but you have a disagreement with your spouse. And love is to assume good intentions. That they weren't just being a jerk just to be a jerk. But maybe it's with a coworker or something like that, and, and you know, love is, is to not be self-seeking in that moment, but want the best for them. The other thing about love is it's, it's telling people about Jesus. Not in like a picketing way that condemns them to hell, but in a way that's loving and Christ-like, because we all know someone who's walked away from the faith. The fourth thing to be an example in is in our forgiving. We can't witness to anyone if we can't forgive them. Grudges and bitterness just build walls. They tear down trust. And honestly, it hardens our heart. And we can't love them. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 tells us, make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Forgive anyone who offends you, not just the people you want to forgive. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Maybe the person you're refusing to forgive is the person God wants you to witness to the most. And maybe by experiencing forgiveness from you, they experience the, the grace of Christ and they begin to experience a life change because you were just willing to forgive. Finally, be an example in living. In my own personal spiritual journey, I keep coming back to this scripture. And it's 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. It says, and we can be sure that we know Him if we obey His commandments. If someone claims to know, I, claims, I know God, but they don't obey His commandments, that person's a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey the Word of God show completely how they love Him. This is how we know we are living in Him. Those who say they live in God should live lives as Jesus did. I think obedience is a weird thing, especially in the church. A lot of my friends who have left the church for one reason or another have some problems with that word obedience. And yet as I look at Scripture, as I look at disciple-making movements across the world, I think the only way we can truly experience the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, the way we truly experience redemption and new life, is to keep His commandments, to live into them, and then let Jesus change us from the inside out. 
What I'm finding as I continue to follow Jesus is that if I don't spend time in the Word, then I don't truly know who Jesus is. And in that day, I feel distant from Christ, and I don't know His heart. But something happens those days, every day that I strive to spend in the Word, something magical happens. Because when we do that, then we begin to help people and see people the way Christ did. We can encourage them the way Jesus did. Our prayer life can start to look like Jesus's, and we can have this intimacy with God, and we can do ministry the way that Christ did. Uh, You see, this obedience leads to something happening in the midst of our lives. Obedience, when, we're, when we obey God, what happens is we begin to see the Master at work in our lives. We begin to see God at work in our lives all around us. One of my mentors, John McKellar, shared this story last week. I want to share it with you. I remember years ago, Guidepost Magazine had a wonderful story that I loved about the classical pianist Paderewski, we'll go with. Y'all can correct me later after service if I butchered that. He was a national hero of Poland. He became prime minister, and when he was prime minister, he did something so fascinating. He wanted to spread the arts out in rural areas that normally didn't get to hear great concerts. So he would go and have piano concerts in these small little country areas. So whenever he was coming, it was a big deal for those communities. One night he was out in a rural area, and the town was so excited. There was this lady whose son had begun who was beginning piano, so she bought tickets and she went with him. She wanted to encourage her son to stay with the piano. They got there, and it was a huge event. The people were all abuzz. The big Steinway was on the stage, and she was so excited. She was visiting with her friends and didn't keep an eye on her son. She didn't notice that he had wandered away. It was time for the concert, and the lights came down, and the spotlights came on, and everyone got quiet. And only then did they notice a little 10-year-old boy was sitting at the Steinway, plucking out Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. The mother gasped when she realized that that was her son. And the stagehands came out to try to get him off the stage. But when they did, Paderewski walked out and he shooed them away. He told them not to do that. And he walked behind the little boy who was pecking out Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. He whispered to him, Don't stop. Keep playing. Don't quit. So the little boy kept playing. And then the great musician kind of took his left hand and put it on the piano and started filling in the bass notes. And then he took his right hand and circled the little boy and started playing the treble notes. They continued to play together for a moment and the crowd was mesmerized. It was just this magical moment as they heard beautiful music. The great master and the young beginner playing together. I think that's the story of our lives. All we can do is our best as meager, as feeble, as untalented as we are. But as we, tr- as we try to play, our master comes behind us and says, don't quit, don't stop, keep playing. But more than that, he takes whatever melody we're trying to play and he joins in it with beautiful harmonies. And that's where the power of faith happens. Obedience is inviting Christ be at work in our lives and see the magic happen. The question for us is, are we being faithful? And are people seeing, are we being an example of Christ in our lives? As they watch us, do they see Jesus or do they see someone no different than the world around them? God has placed you where you are, where you live, where you work, where you play, specifically for a reason. Will you share the good news of Jesus Christ? Will you witness, not just in the words you say, but in the way you live your life? Would you pray with me? Merciful and gracious God, it's easy sometimes to profess with our lips to fall short and not always live in a way that would bring you glory. We feel like Paul and we say we do the things we don't want to do and we don't do the things we want to do. This morning we confess our need for you. We come to the communion table confessing those places in our lives that we need you at work so that then we can be an example of your redeeming grace to those who are watching us.
Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen.